Welcome everyone to another GMC Live. I have my good friend Jan with us. She is a sex industry survivor. She's now a licensed marriage and family therapist. She's a missionary. She works with Exodus Cry. Many of you may already know who she is. She's a great friend, a fellow ministry partner. Thank you, uh, Miss Jan, for coming today. I am just excited to hear about your missions trip to Mexico, to hear about the movie coming out in December, to hear about what's happening with Exodus Cry. What else is happening with your ministry today? Thank you for coming. No, oh, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. <laughs> You're welcome. So Mexico, what made you want to go to Mexico? How did this happen? Um, so the church that I attend in North Las Vegas is called Discovery Church, and our our pastors actually support various ministries um, and missionaries, and um, that's how I actually found out that the trip was going to happen. Um, but the organization that actually sponsors, or I should say hosts, these trip um, is, is called Student Reach. Uh, they have Student Reach and You Reach, um, and so You Reach specifically reaches out to people in Mexico, Nicaragua, and Zambia, um, and they build houses for them. They supply medical supplies. Um, they give them water, clothing. Um, they have an actual shelter for women in Mexico as well, um, where they house women who have been in domestic violence situations and their children, um, because what people don't understand is that these people that we specifically reached out to are below poverty level. That means that they make less than $2 a day. So imagine making less than $2 a day, um, especially as a woman with children or being like a single mother, uh, you don't have the same resources that you would in America. And so they shelter those women, or even if those women have been in trafficking situations, um, which is actually very prevalent there as well, um, they get them out of those situations, they give them education, um, training, and then they actually help them like open businesses so that they can be self-sufficient. Oh, yeah, that's some of the pictures. So the little boy there that you see, his name is Alan, and he was actually the youngest um, of the family that we were helping to build the house for in Mexico. We were actually in Baja, Mexico, and this was just this past summer. So it was an amazing experience, uh, a lot of hard work, but just very eye opening because I myself have actually been homeless as a child. Um, my mother and my sister and I were homeless for a period of time, but even being homeless, we didn't have to endure what these people endure. Um, I don't know, Jeremy, if you can pull up the shack picture. I don't know. I know it's in there somewhere in some of the pictures that I sent you, but they were literally living in a shack that they constructed out of whatever they could find in a dirt lot and there was red ants crawling everywhere um, they didn't have access to clean water they don't have indoor plumbing um, they had an outhouse all of those things and so what we did is we went in there we built a house for them in a period of a week um, we actually built bunk beds for them we gave them uh, like a little a uh, gas stove so that they could start like cooking inside of their house. We provided them with um, like a huge water basin, like a refillable water basin um, and a new showering system. Yeah, that was the shack that they were actually living in. Um, it had like one huge bed in there and her and her husband and her four children all slept on that bed. Um, so horrible living conditions, if you can imagine. And I, I know that you can see all the dirt that's around there. Just red ants were crawling all over that. So it was a, a life altering experience. And you reach does such great work, um, you know, for these people. So, you know, if people want to get involved, they can actually go to student reach. They can go to you reach. Um, you do pay for your own missions trip. Um, and they supply like the housing and the food for you and things like that. Um, the whole trip for me was about $600, but I mean, can you even place a value on, you know, providing a house for someone, you know, providing clean water for someone, providing clothes for someone. So yeah, that was their outhouse that they had before. Um, so we actually gave them a new one as well. And I'm seeing a bunch of different pictures here that 
as you're like building through the house so i'm i'm picking different ones here as you as you've gone through and shown different things like for instance this one here where they're together so that was actually that's not the family but um those were some of the locals and I think it was like on the third day that we were building, they were coming through. And so they were selling those bracelets and that's how they actually provided for themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and each bracelet was like a dollar. So of course I bought some <laughs> and I asked them if I could take a picture of them as well. Uh, many people don't realize exactly what, what they go through and how they, how they how things operate from day to day that, what we think is difficult is nothing compared to how how they try and figure out the day-to-day -day life and where they're going to yeah. go and what they're going to do next and what yeah. kind of and situation what's crazy is, is going to happen. Yeah, a lot of them work in a field um, picking berries for a living, but they literally make only, like I said, maybe $2, a few dollars a day. Um, and then on top of that, in order to even be bused to these fields, if they choose to actually take the bus, um, they have to pay 50 cents there and 50 cents back. So imagine you're only making a couple dollars a day and then you have to pay a dollar just to have transportation. So many of them opt to walk from where they live, which is extremely far to these fields um, and then walk home after their day is done. And they work like eight to nine, 10 hour days sometimes. So they have long, long hours, long commute, and they're not mm. able to, they're not able to get everything that they need in the time that they need. It's just, just a time crunch, just trying to figure out where they're going to go, and what they're going to do next and how things are going to change because too many times it's, it's a decision the last minute of what they'll be able to do. Yeah, it really comes down to, okay, what can I provide for my family today, you know, and it, most of the times they don't have the means to do that. So even like diapers for the little one there, Alan, you know, um, student reach was able to provide them with, with those kinds of things because they didn't even really have access to that stuff. And so, I mean, it's just very eye opening to be able to experience that and see those kinds of conditions that they live in. And I was actually able to do a little side medical missions trip, um, so many people in that area are suffering from various diseases and infections and um, even like diabetes, you know, and they don't have access to health care. So we were doing um, diabetes testing for them, checking their blood sugar levels. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, taking their temperatures, giving them resources um, for free medical um, clinics within their area. Um, and even that, though, to, to be able to get to those clinics, it's it's a distance from them, you know, from where they are. And so it's just very hard for these people to have access to those things that they need. So what do you think the next steps are, what they're going to do? So we have a picture here that you're still continuing building the home. So once the, the trip is over, what are the next steps? What are they trying to do to provide um, continuous care? Well, um, UReach has actually done a lot within Baja, Mexico itself. And like I said, in Nicaragua and in Zambia, but what they do is they follow up with them. They have a team that continually goes to them to see, uh, you know, if they're self-sustaining, to see if there's something else that they might need. Um, to continue to give them those resources that they need so that they can continue to work and provide for their family and keep up the house um, that we've built for them. So it's not just, a, okay, here's a, here's a little thing to do and now it's over. No, it's a continuation. It's a, it's an ongoing relationship. Yeah, definitely. Uh, that's the water tank um, that we provided for them. But yeah, it's, it's follow up, um, aftercare, you know, wraparound services, making sure that they have what they need. So it's a really good organization. And I'm actually thinking about doing Africa next year. Um, that is a little bit more of a costly trip. So I'm not sure if I'll be able to do it or not, but my, my heart has been, um, directed toward Africa for some time now. So I actually have a pastor that I have done some videos with about sex education and how pornography harms people. Um, out there and so i'm hoping that i'd be able to visit him as well that would be good
yeah <laughs> to be able to continue in more so and and i think that's what's changing with the missionary world is is the continuation of what can happen to like physical needs so like housing and food and water and what people can do because these are life-changing events bringing somebody from a first world or even second world country to some place they never been before to provide a service yeah. you're going to talk about this for the rest of your life you're never going to forget it right yeah, exactly. And that's all that um, Student Reach and U-Reach is about. They um, they started in 2000 with that in mind. They wanted to equip people to um, change the world, essentially. Um, and so that's what their primary focus is. That's after everything was completed. Um, and that's the family up front, actually. Um, so you can see the wife. The dad was at work that day, so he wasn't able to be in that picture. But they actually, both mom and dad did a lot to help us build the house as well. So they weren't just like sitting by while we were doing all of the work they were pitching into. That's good. Yeah, that's the family right there. With the exception of dad, dad's not in the picture that day. But they were so happy. It was just, it was awesome to be able to provide them with that. And mom really liked flowers. And so um, the last day I was able to find a flower shop not too far away. And I was able to give her some flowers too, so that she could have it um, inside of the house. So she was actually really good. She had a really good green thumb and she had um, planted all kinds of different flowers in their little, their little lot. And so um, I just really wanted to bless her with that at least. Yeah. <laughs> she was such a sweetheart. And it, I mean, of course they didn't, we had to have a translator the entire time. Um, the family didn't speak English at all, but uh, it was just great to be able to connect with them and, and really get to know more about them. Actually the mom in the situation um, was a victim of domestic violence and trafficking. Um, and so she actually remarried to the man that, um, she's with currently now and, you know, had more children with him, but, uh, you know, that's not even common. A lot of the times women, when they come out of those situations, other men will have nothing to do with them there. So it was a blessing for them to actually be together for this man to take on her and her children. Yeah. She actually made um, soup for us one day. It was so sweet because, you know, they, they have nothing. But yet she wanted to share what she did have with all of us. And, you know, we weren't going to, of course, turn her down and insult her in any kind of way. But it was just the very simple soup. It was chicken and some broth. And, you know, but we were all just thankful um, and very grateful to her for, for doing that for us. So what are your big takeaways from the trip? Um, <laughs> I'll never look at poverty the same in America, for sure. Uh, like I said, I mean, even being homeless and having gone through what I did, um, it's nothing compared to, you know, what they're going through. And it really just solidifies the fact that, you know, outreach is so important, um, you know, and you, you never know what somebody's story is. So really getting to know people that you would usually just pass by on the street, you know, I mean, sometimes I really even like to talk to homeless people and um, just really get to know them and, and know their story and, and see where they're coming from, you know, and I know that that's like easier said than done because a lot of people <laughs> don't want to deal with that kind of population, you know, but you, you don't know what somebody is dealing with until you actually discuss it with them and, and try to have that kind of candid conversation. And you'd be surprised at some of the stories that come out of those. Those, those little intimate moments of coming together and, you know, just working through to see exactly what you're going to do and what happens next and how just different yeah. moments, you know, just even here, just, you know, getting unpacked and going mm -hmm. through this, the day, the, by day moment just what is god going to do in that moment and you know how yeah. something will change and you know hospitality and kindness can go a long way it can be a life-changing altering event yeah well 
Well, and even in this situation, like we all had, it's like very dormitory living, as you can see. <laughs> um, they do extend like a private area um, for families that want to do this, want to build houses. Um, but if you're just coming kind of like as an individual, um, the setup is pretty much those bunk beds and shared spaces. You know, they have separate female and male uh, dormitory type of living situation. And so like really just getting to know people in that sense too, you know, you know, where are you from? What walk of life have you come from? You know, uh, what's your heart? And so it was a really good just time of fellowship as well. And we had church service every morning um, in their little center and, um, you know, uh, really prayed for the entire day before we got started and then came together again in the evening once we were done with the work day and um, just really shared and yeah, it was awesome. Um, it was very interesting, too, because I had to have a camel back with me the entire time because you can drink the water there. Um, mm -hmm. But indoor plumbing was very sketchy on site as well. <laughs> um, and so we actually had to fill like the camelbacks or water bottles from like a pipe that they had inside just clean water um, for us. But it was that in itself was an interesting experience. And most of the restaurants that we went to there as well. Um, because they didn't have indoor plumbing, um, you would actually see like these trash cans next to the toilets where people would dispose of their toilet paper um, after using the bathroom. And so that that was interesting. And that took a little bit to get used to as well. That wasn't the way it was on site. Um, we actually did have plumbing, but you had to be very cautious on um, how much, you know, toilet paper you put into the toilet as well, because anything uh anything like over a little bit could really stop up their plumbing so and i think that i think that's kind of the the change of where we are as a society today and how what we're used to and mm -hmm. at least you know the american to other cultures of what you would experience and what's considered normal because everybody that's living there would probably say, well, this is normal to me. There will be a few that yeah. would say no, but others would say, well, I do want more. So mm -hmm. then there's that sense of urgency for those of us who know something to, to enhance the quality of life, not necessarily change, completely change a culture or completely, right. you know, convert something to your standard, but enhance the standard of the existing culture that's already there and not wiping it out just making it better yeah and they were so i mean every person that i encountered um was just so happy i mean they had nothing but they were like some of the happiest people in the world <laughs> and that's the thing they're very giving they're very understanding they're not wanting they're not wanting a lot they're not wanting too much too little but they're right there in that minute and in that moment saying, okay, this is how, how things are. And, you know, yeah. we'll, we'll go through that and we'll move through that. And they're just saying, you know, God's just going to move forward and transform situations that happen like yeah. this. You know, a lot of times you'll, you'll see things like this and some of them already are Christians. It's not, it's not anything necessarily somebody did. It's just the situation that someone may be currently in in their environment or they're trying to get out of a bad environment like you were talking about yeah definitely yeah and they're constantly building um the campus so they have like a closed off it's very secure as well um campus for you reach and they're just constantly building so even by the time, you know, if I was to go back to Mexico next year, even by the time I go back, it's going to be completely transformed as well and even bigger. Um, they're really trying to accommodate the people that go out there because they realize that it's a sacrifice of time. It's a sacrifice of money. And so they really want to make it as comfortable for um, anybody who wants to volunteer. And that's good that they're wanting to continue to go on to their next steps and people are really interested in what's happening and what God is doing and, and wanting to see how they can transform 
the area and people are catching on they're catching on to the vision and the dream of what god is giving them and that's what's mm. very important because too many yeah. missionaries and missionary organizations are dying off because people aren't catching the vision they're not wanting to volunteer or they're not wanting to do funding or or work alongside them and volunteer and i think it's very important to be able to do that because we're talking about the first people going out typically in some situations uh, many times because you'll mm -hmm. have missionaries do things that the regular church in the area may not do yeah isn't that a cool statue <laughs> uh we actually saw that driving into baja mexico and i just thought that was so amazing that they had that massive statue of jesus there yeah i think that's amazing to see that and it's just a, a symbol of what god is trying to do and captivate mm. people's hearts and minds and realize that when you take a look at this picture here and I, I've seen very similar pictures on postcards or mm -hmm. and even in books and I would never think about at least when I was a kid I would never think about well what is the quality of life there right you always hear in in movies and in songs Oh, you know, let's go to, let's go to, you know, Baja, Mexico, or let's go to Tijuana, or let's go, you know, Bahamas or somewhere. And they'll have a picture that looks like this. And everyone's like, man, I just wish I could sit on that beach. Hmm. Or I wish I could go, you know, hike those mountains. Yeah. But what about the people that are there? Forget the tourism stuff, because obviously the tourism in different countries are well, well built up. Does somebody have a heart when they see this picture? I'm going to think about, I would like to go and help somebody that's there. Yeah. And change their life. And yeah, the ocean the was a, a big plus. It was beautiful. It was gorgeous. But, mm -hmm. you know, our primary focus, obviously, was to be there to to help transition um, this family and just to reach out in general. And so it was just an overall amazing experience. Yeah, I think God has done a great work as he just brought everyone together. Hmm. Yeah, and, and student lives. reach itself. Um, so you can see that there's a lot of younger looking people in the picture. Um, the student reach specifically focuses on students. And so they do a lot of outreach to high schools. They do a lot of outreach to colleges. Um, they really want to get young people involved in this kind of work. Uh, you know, and really show them what it is to be a missionary and to be missionary focused. So it's amazing what they, you know, they are doing. And just to see, I mean, these kids were working hard. <laughs> so it was great to see that. I mean, nobody was like standing by the side. Nobody was complaining. You know, in America, there's so many privileged teenagers and they don't even realize how privileged they are, you know, and, and to see these um, these teenagers, you know, working so tirelessly to, to build this house and, you know, to provide um, essential resources for this family and, and others in the community. It was just amazing. It's a life changing event and mm -hmm. capturing the hearts and minds of somebody at that younger age will set them for a path in their future that is life changing. It's going to be Christ minded if you do that. Now, I do know there are a lot of times that people that are young will go on something like this and they may forget about it for a time. Mm -hmm. But then somebody else that's in this picture runs into them at the grocery store or finds them on social media and says, Hey, remember when we did this and start having dialogue and talk about things? Mm -hmm. And for me personally, I've I've had that with different things I've been involved in. You find somebody later on and have that dialogue. And some of them are struggling. Some of them are off track. Some of them are on real great track and they're running ministries and things. It's going to set them apart yeah. and lead them to a place that God wants to continue to bless their lives. And like I said, this family is never going to forget the kindness and generosity of everybody in this picture. Yeah. Definitely. I agree. <laughs>
I think God is going to do an amazing work and will continue. And and I'm kind of I'm kind of excited to see you may be going back to Mexico, you may be going to South Africa, you could be going anywhere else. You'll have lots of opportunity for speaking in other acting events across the United States. Mm. So God is doing a lot of amazing things for you as he continues to work through your life. With the, with the Mexico missions, and now you're talking about South Africa. We know there's some modeling things. You're talking about a movie coming up in December. <laughs> yeah. I mean, is there anything you can't do? <laughs> I don't know yet. <laughs> um, no, seriously, though, I'm just honored and blessed whenever God presents me with an opportunity to, to use me in the way that he does, because he didn't bring me out of the pit to not go back into it and bring other people out of it as well. And, you know, I know that this is my cross to carry, but I carry it very happily. Um, and I can't imagine my life being any other way than it is right now. It's not easy. Um, and some days I do cry by myself <laughs> um, a lot, but at the same time, you know, I know that nothing that I do for the Lord is done in vain. Um, and that, you know, no matter what, he's going to honor the work that I do and and bless it and that he goes before me and that he's always with me. So I just show up. I say that I'm here, Lord, use me and trust him to do the rest. And that's a good mindset to have to see what, you know, God wants to do. So you go from being outside to working in Mexico. <laughs> And now we're talking about when I don't it's really up to you which one you want to go next. So we can either talk about the movie or you want to talk about Exodus Cry. Yeah, we could talk about the movie for a little Let's bit. Let's talk about the movie. Now I know I don't have okay. a picture about the movie, but because I didn't oh. know exactly what we could share or not share. So I didn't know if you had to like wait till December or you could just say, Hey, there's gonna be a trailer coming out at the end of November. Stay tuned or what can well, so there's no trailer as of yet. Um, the film is called Starstruck and mm -hmm. it had Eddie McClintic in it. Um, he was the male lead. And um, I actually found out about the audition for the movie. It's through JC Films. They do a lot of work. And actually, Kevin Sorbo does a lot of work with JC Films as well. Mm -hmm. um, but I found out about the audition through my church. And um, I've always had a passion for legitimate uh, acting and modeling as well. <laughs> And so I just decided that I would try out for a part. I got a small speaking part. I wasn't even expecting that. So yeah, it was an awesome experience. Um, much longer hours than I had anticipated. <laughs> and it was all volunteer work. So even like Eddie McClintock, you know, nobody got paid for the film. Um, it was just everybody who has a heart for Christ um, and wanted to do a Christ-centered type of film. So it's a little lighthearted, some comedy in it. But I think it's going to be um, a really good film and it's supposed to come out in December. So now that's exciting. So we'll have to stay yeah. tuned to find out about that stuff. Yeah. yeah. And when I do know about any kind of trailers or anything like that, I'll let you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We might come up with some kind of plan, you know, with what we'll do <laughs> next with that. Yeah. But the one thing, and, and I was, I'm looking at this picture before I share it. I remember mm -hmm. the last time there were more people in this picture. I remember. <laughs> yeah, so that was actually from today. Um, mm -hmm. So I did the Family Empowerment Summit and my pastor, well, he's my associate pastor now, but he used to be my main pastor um, at the Las Vegas Dream Center, but he's now the associate pastor at Discovery Church. Mm -hmm. um, he has done for many, many years, a lot of work with men um, to educate them about the harms, uh, harms of pornography um, and to work with the city and Metro and the government here um, to protect children against sex trafficking and human trafficking. Um, but um, obviously I've worked with Exodus Cry voluntarily, um, I think since 2014. <laughs> I think that's when I first really started talking to them. I don't remember the exact year, but it's been a while. Um, and that was for a documentary. And then since then, I've kind of been in touch with them over the years to share my story and, um, you know, to help them out with various things when um, they need it, when they needed somebody with a voice um, who wasn't share, uh, scared to share their story about what had happened to them in a porn industry. And so it was an honor, an absolute honor um, to be trusted with, uh, you know, representing them today. 
at the Family Empowerment Summit um, because they usually don't let people who are outside of their organization do any kind of representation for them. So um, I'm severely blessed to be able to do that. And for people who are not familiar with Exodus Cry, um, it's a nonprofit organization that fights sexual exploitation using three strategic ways. Um, and that is by uh, reaching out to people. Obviously, they reach out to people and engage with people who are currently bound by sexual exploitation um, and offer them a way out. But they also do a lot um, with changing laws, uh, advocating um, to have laws that uproot commercial sexual exploitation and actually defending people who have been exploited um, and then really shifting culture. Um, and that is a huge primary focus that they have, which involves um, powerful messaging through videos, through films, through podcasts, um, through conferences and through written word. Oh yeah, awesome. Um, and so one of the things, and I don't know if you can scroll to it, um, it might be under Get Involved. Uh, one of the major campaigns that they have right now is the End Teen Porn campaign. So obviously the porn industry has been using and abusing teenagers in pornography for decades. Mm -hmm. created a petition trying to uh, change the age of entry into the porn industry from 18 to 21. Um, and that's obviously because a lot of teenagers who choose to go into porn, you know, don't understand the nature of the beast. They don't really understand or are not mentally prepared um, for what they'll face um, and the volatility of, of the porn industry. Um, and obviously, you know, I would like to see the age increase to 25 because the brain isn't even mature until the age of 25. This is really a strong stepping stone um, toward that. And in conjunction with that, they actually have um, a docuseries that they released uh, called Beyond Fantasy, um, which really, you know, dives into the coercion and the abuse that happens um, in the porn industry. And it actually has porn producers and actresses even talking about what goes on um, behind the scenes of, of the camera, you know, um, when a, a film is being produced. And so it's really impactful, it's really powerful. Um, episode two has not been released yet. It will be in a couple of weeks from what I've what I've been told. I am in episode two, and that's definitely more of a hardcore um, episode. And then I believe I'm in episode three as well. Um, but I strongly suggest that anybody who really wants to know the truth about what happens in the porn industry, watch this docuseries. Yeah, so they can actually either go to Exodus Cry's site directly, um, or they can go to their YouTube as well, and it's completely free to watch. But they do such good work too, just in in general, um, protecting children and really, um, you know, advocating for for those people who are stuck in the sex industry or people who are wanting to get out but really don't know how to. Um, I know that, you know, for parents specifically, and that's what the Family Empowerment Summit was really focused on um, today, Exodus Cry released a documentary called Raised on Porn. Um, and it really highlights how uh, the porn industry um, has really, or porn in general, um, has really become the new form of sex education for children, which is very sad. Um, very troubling. And so I would suggest like parents who want to know how to better protect their children um, also view that documentary. But they actually have a lot of resources um, for faith-based resources. They have resources for children, resources for men, for women um, on their website as well that people can access for more information. Oh yeah, please sign the petition. <laughs> please, please, please sign the petition. Um, we're trying to get to at least 10,000, as you can see in the screen right now. Um, I did get a lot of signatures today, which I was very thankful for, but, you know, more work needs to be done. We really need people getting behind this um, to affect change. 
Yeah, so, and here they're talking about cigarettes in Ohio. I don't know if you've seen that. Or they wanted to raise the age of cigarettes. So if you're No, going to I raise didn't see the, that. so if you're going to raise the age of cigarettes, then, and they're talking about, you know, then why wouldn't you raise the age of someone who can produce a film with such Yeah. an intimate act? Mm hmm They're saying that you're not responsible enough to drink and smoke till you're 21. How are you going to be responsible enough with the intercourse that you can provide on film? Yeah. Much less in your own personal personal lives. Yeah. And it's, it's like, I've always said, you know, from the time that I started doing uh, ministry and outreach, you know, people don't understand. They see this pretty little package, uh, you know, dressed up and um, portrayed the way the porn industry wants you to see it, you know, but they don't understand the abuse and the coercion and everything that the actresses and actors have to go through behind the scenes in order to make that film happen. Um, yeah. You know, a lot of the huge argument is of course, well, this is a choice. Well, it is and it isn't because they don't understand that once you're in it, it's so hard to get out of it because of the harassment and because of the threats, you know, because of the abuse. Um, you're really made to believe that you're 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 nothing, you know. Um, you get degraded on camera constantly. It's just it's just so much that goes on behind the scenes. Um, and so, uh, Exodus Cry does a really great job of explaining in depth more about that. So what you're looking at right now is the letter that was signed by Jan and others. Yeah, that was the open letter to the porn industry expressing why uh, we feel that it's so important um, to raise the age from 18 to 21. And that's the petition that people can sign to help us out. And of course, if you do it, go ahead and share so others can see it too. Yeah. <laughs> when we go back here, there are other stats that you could find out as we talked about. Mm -hmm. About what is Yeah, happening. and that's one of the biggest things that I suggest people do is like really, you know, look into the statistics, you know, find out more, do research. It's really not that hard to find. You know, especially about people who are actually dying because of this industry. Um, I think people are so taken back with that idea, but it's true. And, you know, I call it the secondary negative effects of the porn industry, but it's alcohol overdose, it's drug overdose, it's suicide. I mean, there's such a huge number of people that are suffering from mental illness within this industry, you know. Uh, people who have already experienced severe trauma and that's kind of what led them down this dark path to get into the porn industry in the first place but then coupled with that you know they experience more trauma sexual trauma a mental um, trauma in the industry while they're in there and um, it's just very catastrophic and some people can't handle that so they end up taking their own lives and anybody who's familiar with my story knows that I almost did the same thing Um, but if it wasn't for God intervening and Shelley Lubin intervening, then I wouldn't be here today. So, you know, it's just really important to know um, the nature of the beast because there's so much that goes into it. I remember sending you a Christmas card, right, as you were in the process of almost transitioning out. Yeah. <laughs> a lot. It seems like a forever ago, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh. So here you're seeing how to become an abolition church. And many people think about William Wilberforce and it's no different. It's, Mm -hmm. it's important for churches to get involved, to protect your congregation, protect Yeah. the spouse of your leaders. Mm As -hmm. we see so many leaders are falling for finances and relationships, things they've done wrong ethically, things they've said wrong. Domestic violence, rape, yeah, incest. Well, and what affairs. breaks my heart, honestly, Jeremy, is that a lot of churches are not willing to have these kinds of conversations. 
Um, it's just very taboo, but they don't understand like how how it affects their church body as a whole and how many men and women are actually suffering with porn addiction and especially the youth. Right. And so more churches definitely need to get involved um, and actually be willing to have these kinds of conversations and host people who can actually come to their church and talk to them about these issues. It's so important um, to start, you know, addressing it head on and and stop being scared (laughs) of these kinds of conversations. Yeah, as soon as you take the, uh, put the light in the darkness, that's Mm -hmm. the thing. There's just too much, um, I think part of it's a fear of, well, you're going to see who's, who responds, who goes to the altar or who, who has that kind of conversation. And, and that, that's what you would want. But Mm -hmm. because too many times, a lot of people, we're not talking about the church, we're not talking about the denomination, we're talking about people aren't going to church for church they're going just to see what's going to happen yeah so you're having you're having two different more factions going on but you can't be afraid of that mm-hmm. yes there'll be some you know outlash yes there'll be some pushback yeah people are going to talk about it i know some people did porn and waffles or something like that and they meet for breakfast and they would talk about you know uh trying to stop you know watching porn and you know having a accountability partner to you know check in and they were talking about watching porn and masturbation and 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 you know how you spend time with your spouse or if you're single what what to avoid you know what kind of people what kind of toxic behavior in a person that's of the opposite gender should you not go out with because you'll be ensnared uh, what mm-hmm. should you do to your life? You know, like I said, what are you watching? What are you reading? How are you spending your time? And having other people be accountable. And and if you're not talking about these things, then you're just over here by yourself. Mm-hmm. And you're yeah. like, God help me. And there's all these other people that want to help you. But then if you don't reach out, it's just like getting saved. You know, you got to reach out to people. You got to call on Jesus. You have to take the darkness and put the light on it. Yeah. You have to bring this out there and say, yes, I don't want to deal with this. Yes, I struggle with this or, you know, I need accountability in this. And what can I do? Because or the other thing is, is you think you got it all together. That's what a lot of that stories I hear from people. You probably heard this too. But I have it all mm-hmm. together. You know, I don't need the accountability partner. And, you know, I'm a ministry leader. So I counsel people of the opposite sex and they're in a room alone. And what eventually Mm -hmm. happens, something happens. And I've seen Mm -hmm. it in the counseling world, and I've seen it in the ministry world, somebody falls. Yeah. Because there's just not enough of that correct accountability, correctness of where you know what's happening, where someone's at, what's going on, uh, where you're going next. And when you isolate yourself like that, you set yourself up for failure. Like the Bible says, the devil is like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Well, what does the, mm-hmm. what does the lions do and the cheetahs do? They're all hiding, you know, in the grass or, you know, they're up in a tree and they're just waiting, watching, and they could do mm-hmm. it for hours, yeah. you know, and they could just lay there and be pretend sleeping and just let it walk <laughs> around. And it, you know, the, the, the animal gets confidence. I know they going to happen to me. And then it gets dark or something changes and boom. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, so, and avoiding the issue too is not going to make it go mm-hmm. away. You no, know? it won't. It won't <laughs> change. It won't change anything. And I think that is part of the problem. If you turn on any of the, you know, the the TV apps that exist out there, and you can type in in any of these words, sex or porn or or some kind of thing, it'll come back with stuff. Mm-hmm. And it's not just the typical, you know, R-rated stuff. It's going beyond that now. Mm-hmm. And some of these apps, they're not behind a paywall anymore. People yeah. have phones. This stuff's not on a paywall. If you don't have a an adult, you know, uh, masking internet or some kind of like child safe, whatever, people can type whatever they want on these phones. And yeah. that's what these kids are doing. You know, well, and because- that's another campaign that Exodus Cry actually has going on right now, too. And that was like a great um, segue into that is uh, they have a campaign called uh, Protect Children Not Porn, which calls for any pornographic hosting site 
to verify the age of the consumer with an actual photo identification card, um, not giving them access to any content before their age is verified. Um, and so that to to sign that petition as well is is needed, um, you know, because you're right. I mean, there's so many sites that children can just Google, right, and go to and immediately they're inundated with tons of pornographic images for free, you know, so um, something like this, uh, obviously you see right there, they're trying to get to 100,000 and they have a little over 93,000 right now, um, you know, it, it's so needed as well. And more and more people, more and more hosting sites need to be held accountable and they need to actually verify the age of the consumer. Yeah, and, and this is going to go two different directions, I would think. It's either going to go to the search engines mm -hmm. or they're going to push it back to make the Internet hosting. So, for instance, like Spectrum or AT&T and Verizon, that there's a block already at that level. And the only way to turn it off is the adult that's paying for the Internet has to mm -hmm. turn it off. Yeah. That it's already on. You can't yeah. go to I mean, it. And unless you turn it off. And there's good sites that people can go to to try to protect their children from going to these um, sites. I know that one of them obviously is Covenant Eyes. Um, mm -hmm. I think another one is called Bark. Uh, I think it's Bark. <laughs> I know that's more of like a newer one that's really um, coming out now and a lot of people are utilizing to protect their children from images and, and pornographic websites. But Covenant Eyes has always been my go-to um, for that. And that's one that I highly recommend for people. Yeah. Um, and they have a lot of really good resources on their website as well. Yeah. Yeah. See, <laughs> they feel like it's an issue too. They're talking about how porn affects the church. So, you know, it's just, it's a conversation that needs to be had for sure. And then more churches need to do this. They need to mm -hmm. want to book speakers. They need to listen to interviews like this to, to learn more information because people probably don't know it's out here that you can you can go to this website and you can uh, figure out exactly what you need to do and protect your your family or, or your individual or whatever it is you're trying to do. How many people mm -hmm. are in there? Yeah. You know, you can put in an app on your phone, you can put it on, on the internet and it monitors what comes in Yeah, and, um, it's going to block it. Mm hmm. Yeah. So there's information right there about their apps and, you know, how you can access them and, and what, what it does. So I, I just think it's an awesome resource for parents to have as well. Yeah. And, um. With the way things are going, uh, especially like stuff like Snapchat, um, I get this daily, 10 to mm -hmm. 25 friend requests. Some of them have a profile, some don't. Mm -hmm. And the last week, because I knew this interview was coming, I wanted to see what was going on. So I've just been adding people blind. Let's see what happens. First thing, it's automatic. It's a picture or a video. Mm -hmm. This is a teen app. It's an automatic whatever. And then there's a URL. If someone clicks the URL, it's a spam and it's stealing information and hacking your phone or your or your tablet or your computer under the guise of, hey, I want you to, you know, come come hang out. Or another one is, hey, do you want to be you want a sugar mama? You know, I'll pay you five hundred dollars if you do this, 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 this. Here's my phone yeah. number. Text me. Here's my email. Text me. And this is available yeah. for kids. It's mm -hmm. out there for kids right now to just. Yeah. Now, the thing is, obviously, Snapchat in the last couple of updates, they've been holding themselves a little more accountable. So they have like a system now to verify some of the spam and you can put in there and tell it this is spam. This is sex nudity, you know, child endangerment and it, and then it block it. But it's not stopped. So obviously there's people out there that know how to mass produce emails and videos and stuff and this is stuff hitting kids because snapchat's mostly a kid app it's not yeah. someone a 40 50 year old is normally going to be on mm -hmm. so you have yeah. to be you know coherent and understanding 
what kind of time and season we're in right now as Christians as there's things out there you should probably tell your kid I don't want you on snapchat I don't want you on Facebook I don't want you on the internet after XYZ time what is your internet setting can you go to XYZ site and does it work are you going to get something like this to block it yeah because I think like you were saying uh we either don't want to have this conversation or we're ignorant to the fact that our family and our spouses or our children mm -hmm. would even go and look at this would even yeah. participate in that oh not my kid oh right. not, my, not 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 my spouse not my boyfriend not my girlfriend oh mm -hmm. they could never do that yeah yeah let's not talk about it because it's not happening let's just go ahead and block it so it can't happen even if it isn't a temptation to you because many people come back and say jeremy well i don't struggle with masturbation or, i don't struggle watching this stuff i don't i don't watch any of this stuff block it anyway because a lot right. of times these things that are out there have an underlying level of hacking code that's trying to you know steal the rest of your information or break into somebody's you know internet provider and break into that so mm -hmm. this has gone way beyond just someone being creepy and wanting you know have you know degenerate sex they're now wanting to destroy an internet infrastructure they're wanting to destroy your banking information they want to take all your information out so you have mm -hmm. to be careful you have to be aware of all the things yeah. that are going on yeah and i think it goes beyond parents having a conversation i mean obviously parents need to have these kinds of conversations with their children as well um, but you know, children are going to be children. <laughs> mm -hmm. So parents really need to take those necessary steps to protect them. Yes, you have to, you have to be aware. You have to understand that protecting the sanctity of the internet that comes in on your mobile or comes in on your home or your tablet is a peace of mind because you're trying to set things up in your household so that God is ordained. God is being blessed. So how we spend our time on our on our phones and how we spend our time on our tablets and everything else like that. I mean, most people sit here during the lunch hour and they say, yeah, mom, yeah, I had a good day. And they're just constantly on this phone. They're not even looking at their their spouse. They're not looking at their kids. They're just on they're just on their phones they're playing their games and this stuff is popping up and nobody's coming over the shoulder and saying well what are you looking at well they'll just minimize it or close it they know how yeah. to clear their history they're not ignorant of the tools of how they work right So what are next steps for you, Miss Jan? Where are you, where, where are you going to go with this next? I know we had a discussion about this before we started this broadcast, and there's a lot of things behind the scenes. But you, as you just said, you were a speaker at this recent event for Exodus Cry. So what happens next for you? Um, I mean, I'm going to continue to partner with Exodus Cry as well, but I'm working with a close friend of mine to try to revamp the Pink Cross Foundation. Um and really just, you know, um, continue where Shelly Lubin left off, <laughs> um, if that's even possible, because the woman was amazing and she definitely did not get the credit that she deserved for a lot of the things that are happening now um, in the fight against pornography and the injustices that are happening. Because I want people to understand that, yes, first and foremost, I'm a Christian um, and, you know, the porn industry portrays sex in a very um, volatile way and it's unnatural and there's nothing true about it. However, it's also just as important to protect the people who are in that industry and fight for their rights um, to make sure that they're not being abused, you know, and that they're not forced into similar situations that I experienced. Um, so it's not just about shutting down the porn industry or anything like that. It's about protecting people, loving on people. Um, you know, we get a, back, a lot of backlash from the porn industry. They're like, oh, you just want to shut us down. Well, no, I, I'm sharing my story because this is a very similar, um, you know, reoccurring event 
with most of the actresses and performers that are in the industry. And so I want to protect them and I'm going to do whatever I can to make sure that that happens. Um, so just really trying to work that out, um, continuing to do missions work. I'm very involved in my church at Discovery um, Life Center here in North Las Vegas. And uh, I lead a life group with my sister and that's called Divas of Destiny. <laughs> and so I'm just, you know, I, I'm, leaving myself open, I should say, to be led by the Lord and whatever he has for me. So I'm not exactly sure what that looks like, <laughs> but um, I have a heart that's willing and I have a heart for people, especially young girls. I actually do some work with Teen Challenge as well um, with their adolescent girls, and I'm an advocate for them. And, you know, there's just so many things that people can get involved in. And so I really encourage anybody who wants to get involved in this fight, support this fight, please contact me, um, you know, and uh, we can go from there. And how can people contact you? Um, so they can email me. That's probably the best form of contact right now. And that is at Jan, J-A-N dot M is in Michael, F is in Frank, T is a Tom at Yahoo.com. So Jan dot MFT at Yahoo. Okay. So Jan dot MFT at Yahoo.com. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I think we should finish this with prayer. Can you start with a prayer for those that are, I know we're covering different things here. So we're going to have to talk about Mexico. We're going to have to talk about the porn industry. We're going to have to talk about those that struggle with, you know, viewing porn and, and all of that encompasses. But can we have a prayer about that for you right now, please? Yeah, sure. Okay. Heavenly Father, we just come to you in prayer. We thank you so much, Father God, for this time that we've had together, Lord God, and for the work, the very important work that you're doing um, through organizations like Exodus Cry, Father God, in and through me, Lord God, in and through Jeremy, Lord. Um, and just ask and pray that you continue to bless student reach and you reach in their ministry efforts, Father God, to reach the lost and the brokenhearted, Father God, and provide essential um necessities for them, Father God. Lord, I just ask and pray that you would uh, continue to bless um, and, and go before us in the fight against um, the injustices and the illegal activities that are happening in the porn industry, Father God, that you continue to give us favor, Father God, with, um, you know, heads of state, Father God, and government officials, Lord God, and that you would just continue to affect change in those areas, Lord. And for anybody who's struggling with porn addiction um, or who has been you know, sexually uh, coerced into doing things that they never agreed to do, Father God, for people who are stuck in those kinds of situations, Lord God, that you would just provide them with a way out, Father God, right now, Lord, and Lord Jesus, that you would just, um, just pour out your love and salvation upon them, Father God, and give them the discernment and wisdom they need, Father God, and the direction that they need so that they can get out of those addictions and, and out of that industry, Lord. And Lord, I just ask and pray, Father God, for all missionaries and, and missions, um, Father God, for the mission field in general, Lord. There's just so much that's needed, so much help that's needed, and so many people um, that could step up, Father God. So I just ask and pray that anybody who's watching this right now, Lord God, that you would just put it on their heart, Father God, to really go to you and ask you what it is that you have for them, what it is that your will would be for them to get involved, Father God, in different um, ministries, Father God, in missionary work, Lord. And I just thank you so much for that, Lord God. And I pray that testimonies come out of this video, Father God, and out of the continuous work that both Jeremy and I are doing and other people are doing in your mighty and wonderful name. We ask it. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Miss Jan, for coming today, sharing about Mexico Mission, sharing about Exodus Cry, about Covenant Eyes, and what God is doing with your life and through you and through the lives of others for His glory. Thank you so much yeah. for this opportunity to come today. Thank you.